Let's do our best. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is the, I guess, September meeting of the Land Use Landmarks Committee for Community Board 2. And uh, welcome board. Meeting is, as you may have heard, it's being recorded, uh, just to let you know. All right. Uh, and we'll introduce you to our, uh, actually, I want to ask people who will uh, to introduce themselves as members of the committee. Uh, so, well, I, I will first hold, I will first introduce uh, Karen Johnson, who is our secretary. And, Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your help on that. No and I'll introduce uh, Daughtry Gustafson, who's our co chair. I am Carlton Gordon. And I'll ask individual members of the committee also to introduce themselves as well. My name, name is Ernest. Okay. Go ahead, Ernest. My name is uh, Ernest Augustus, member of um, the Land Use Committee and also a Transportation uh, Committee. Thank you. My name is Esther Blount. I'm a member of Land Use and Transportation Committee. Thank you, Esther. You put put the new members on the spot. Kari Bailey. Hi, everyone. My name is Kari Bailey. This is my first committee meeting um, as a as a board member. I've attended a tell few times a little, in the past. Thank you, Kari. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I live in um, I've lived in downtown Brooklyn for a few years now. Um, I'm an urban planner. I may work for New York City Parks. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Carrie. I hope to see you at all at the future meetings. Uh, and also, I guess we have Cheryl Williams. Will Cheryl Williams, right? Will Williams, right. Williams. Hi, it's also my first meeting. Um, I am retired, having worked at CUNY for a lifetime and um, I was in higher ed administration and the classroom. So I'm looking forward to working with the board. All right, so congrats on your retirement and I'm glad you're able to get, you know, get through and get your pension. And uh, <laughs> yes. I'd love to see you at meetings as well. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And I uh, just wanted to let people know on um, but right, we'll ask. Uh, Carlton, sorry, okay. is Brian here? Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Brian Howell? Yeah. He's not here. You are running short. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. And I John Dew was well, here. John okay, Dew, John. Uh, I'm a long term member of Community Board 2, appointed by Council Member Tis James. And I'm a member of the Transportation Committee and a former chair of Community Board too. Thank you, John. Is Yvette here? Have we seen Yvette tonight? Uh, Yvette, uh, yeah, I don't know if she's making She's supposed to be getting together with a, an alumni thing. That's what I had in the back of my mind. So I don't, she was hoping to, come for a little bit and then leave early. I think we're, well, we're gonna, we'll make, we'll just have to make do. thank you. Oh, as, while I have you here, Karen, I just will let uh, committee members know, uh, thanks for your work that, you know, it's one of the toughest things to do uh, is to take the minutes for these meetings. I always say that the minutes for the Landmark Land Use Committee are the toughest for the board. Uh, because of all the fact patterns and information that comes up. Uh, at times, Karen has to uh, take a, you know, a, a month out here or there. So I'll be asking members of the committee to step in on occasion, you know, just if you volunteer, and it will really help uh, to, you know, facilitate things. So uh, just keep in mind that, you know, 
in case Karen can't make it in the month, you know, for a future meeting, uh, please voluntarily step up and help out. Thank you. Okay. All right, next we have, so we've gone through the uh, members. Uh, next, uh, we'll ask for, yes, uh, I guess we'll do the people, I guess, from the public. We'll ask people from the public who would have any comments uh, who are not members of the committee or on the board, uh, if they have any comments they want to make on the agenda. I'll give it a moment. So, Carlton, you're asking about the agenda um, or the minutes? Mm -hmm. uh, not yet. Yeah, I'm about <laughs> just to I'm gonna do agenda, then I'll do minutes. I just want to first get it gets from you know anybody who wants to make any you know the public make the the comments of, on the agenda. Uh, appears that there's no one who wants to make comments on the agenda, so now we'll uh, we'll do the agenda itself. Uh, is there any objection to the uh, agenda? You know, to the agenda to the entry of the agenda. Uh, just to let you know, again on the agenda. We're, we're switching around the place order on the LPC applications. Uh, Hicks will be the 205 Hicks will be the fourth and uh, two Grace Court Alley will be the third as requested. Uh, hearing no objection, hearing no objections, the agenda is adopted. Okay, now we'll ask for minutes. Uh, we'll ask for again for the minutes from June of two, 2020. Uh, are there any objections to the uh, entry of the minutes? Move to approve, John Do. Okay, I'll take a second. I'll second. I'll second it. Okay. okay, go ahead. Hearing no further objections, the, uh, the minutes have been adopted. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's go right to the Landmark Preservation Commission applications. Um, uh, now, all these are in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, Judy Stanton is running late, I think as I've said. Uh, so she's asked, she's passed on, I think some of you, most of you have seen the uh, summary of her comments. So what we'll do is that I will just give a, you know, after the presentation of the item or the application, I will just give Judy's a little, a briefly that you can, and hopefully she'll uh, join us when she can. Okay, so we're now starting with 170 uh, Jerome Street, which is also known as the Packer uh, Collegiate, you know, famous school uh, that we have had there for many, many years. Um, now we did have this, uh, and I re do remember that we did do it about probably a couple of years ago. We had applications on this. Uh, Packer has come back to us and want to make some changes, basically, on some of the work that they want to do, especially for work on some of the uh, letting in glass uh, openings to allow light going into some of the uh, into some of the classrooms at the lower level. Uh, they want to do some work some other work around the bill that was, it's a modification of the original application. Uh, it's a very extensive one, I'm not gonna go through it, but instead I will ask the um, Packer Collegiate 170 Jerome Street to step up and give their uh, summary or their uh, their uh, presentation on this matter. Thank, thank you so much. I'm Jen Weyburn. I'm the uh, head of school at Packer. And I believe Claire Weiss, our partner at WXY, is going to share some slides. Is it possible for you to do that, Claire? Yeah, if you could enable me, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, um, Taya, can you give uh, them the uh, ability to do that? That's why she should be all set. Okay, great. So I'm doing share screen. There we go. Thank you very much. 
And I'll just okay. introduce myself and then hand it right over to Claire. Uh, just to reiterate what we're what we're presenting to you tonight is a proposed modification to our garden house design that was reviewed and approved in 2019. Um, you know, of course, we couldn't launch into the project because of the pandemic. Uh, and we took the intervening time to sort of pause and uh, you know think about how to evolve the plan to make it even better. Uh, the core of the project has not changed at all. We've refined something, uh, some aspects of the internal educational plans for the space, uh, and we've deepened our sustainability and accessibility goals for the project. Um, in sum, this is an adapted and simplified uh, project from what you saw in 2019. The brick facade uh, more closely aligns now with the architecture of our campus and the surrounding neighborhood. And we also had a need for an all weather connection from the garden house to our uh, other building founders hall. Uh, and But that connector won't be visible from Livingston. Um, so that's the essence of it. And I'm, I'd love for Claire, our partner at WUXY to, to give you much more information. Thank you. And thank you for having us here. It's really appreciated. I'm going to go. Um, since I think many of you, as you said, you this is an amendment, I'm going to just quickly go through the sort of neutral slides because the, uh, the addition to the garden house is in the same place and around the same size. But here's a kind of a view of the whole assemblage of buildings, a timeline um, of the last uh, modifications being uh, uh, or addition with the gym in 67 and now this addition, there's been other modifications, but the, the character of the buildings today, this is the existing site plan, which you reviewed before. We're gonna, the, um, and I've added a, a slide in at the request of the Brooklyn Heights Association, just to kind of be clearer about the garden, but the garden design, again, the substance is the same, the same number of trees are being removed and added, but the configuration is more organic and curvilinear than what you saw in 2019. But really that mostly what we're talking about is that now this building is really used for lower school classrooms. That's where the need is for Packers to connect the lower school students directly to the garden and to resolve conflicts and space needs in the upper school by giving more space in Founders Hall, which is that central building to the upper school. And so this is what you all saw in 2019. So I've just brought, brought back those slides so you could see it. These were the number of trees that are, and today, uh, and this is what you previously approved. And this is sort of the direction we're looking at here, which is really a more organic and less of a, rectilinear, so more, probably more planting in the new plan as it progresses. This is the garden house uh, views, the existing views, and I want to now go right to the update. So the update, again, the approved had a more complex program, maker space below grade. We're now looking at the almost kind of the lower grade, getting natural light into first grade classrooms. And again, all of this building is really classroom. And of course, the support for classrooms. On the first floor right off the garden is the second grade, similarly, as opposed to kind of the previous program that was there. And you can see there were smaller classrooms originally, same number of floors. Here's the third grade. And then finally, the fourth grade on the third floor. So it's a three-story building. The attic level remains mechanical, again, shielded mechanical space. And, um, and you'll see better here. This is the space being filled in that you approved 2019. What was the existing now does have a stairwell. And you can see below it proposed. And I'm going to go zoom in to these when I show you the elevation. So to the left is existing. That's being removed in the dashed lines. And here's the proposed. And I'm going to compare what you approved to the left with what we're proposing today. So to the left was 
a kind of different shape, glassier. Today you can see it's really the three punch windows and a brick wall, some brick detailing. And then now I'm gonna to go to the garden facade, not the Livingston facade. Uh, the existing as per 2019, this is the elevation, which was terracotta and glass primarily in, a, in um, 2019 approved, fully approved. These are the modifi modified facade. Again, uh, classrooms for lower school, a kind of scaled down entrance. And those arched windows really reflect the ability of this masonry arch to, for us to get more light into the lower classrooms. And then it's a, a kind of uh, brick facade. The entire, I wanted to talk a little bit about sustainability. This building, we really hope will be a model for um, uh, in low embodied carbon, as in the structure will be wood, uh, cross laminated timber wood. And we hope that all the brick will be uh, reclaimed or recycled brick, you know, red brick, but really from either the building itself where things are being taken down, like with that stairwell, or from other buildings where we can have a re, you know, an older reclaimed brick building. And again, the windows, and you'll see in a minute, are also. Um, either special double pane with this insulating thing or will be triple pane. So there's a, there's a real goal for to achieve passive house standards and to um, have a very green building here. So I'm gonna show you with it kind of how it fits in. Easier probably to see in the elevations, the existing, this is what approved North Elevation previously. So against existing, this is what the proposed, again, more of windows in a masonry wall in a brick wall. Now I'm looking at the party wall condition. There was two kind of rectangular windows. We're really looking again, because of getting light in, uh, long windows that are above viewing height, but gets light towards the top of the ceiling, almost like a transom window facing the other courtyard. These sections just help you understand the, the kind of restoration and reuse of the original garden house, the stair against the original garden house wall and that connector. Again, a section cut through where the elevator shaft is. And again, the, the just the stacking, uh, cellar, cellar is still mechanical space. And this shows you that section just to point out the first grade classroom has the arch windows and then kind of a glass mm -hmm. sidewalk. So the combination of the two is what gets you the light into the lower level. And there's kind of a little bridge to get you up uh, to the second grade classroom. All of the floors align with the existing garden house. And here's the view from, and we try to match the views from the 2019 application. Uh, the existing site, the proposed massing. This is, was the approved massing against proposed. Again, we're not touching the fence, the garden wall, anything on Livingston. And this shows you again, those rendered facades. So existing, proposed. And then just to go through, um, kind of you can see the brick, more rendering, same view. And uh, a rendered view, again, not you know as realistic as possible from the garden with the wood, uh, some wood shutters and wood windows with that scaled down arched entrance. And you can, you know, there'll be a lot of garden, but that you can see the arched openings into the lower level. Obviously, with the with the trees, which are not being touched at the front, hard to see, but so here you can kind of see just fading the trees and here with no garden vegetation at all, just to kind of see it building only how it works. And now I'm just giving you a little bit of the context across the street at Livingston. Again, there are lower windows and what the scale is with the apartment uh, building and mixed townhouses. And I'm just going to quickly clip through these to go to the material selection slide. So again, reclaimed brick, bird safe glass, wood clad windows, 
you can see the facade. And then the connector piece, our ideal would be to do again, wood framing on the inside and then the glass, much like the atrium that's there, a kind of frameless glass on the outside. And there's also some views of the, this is kind of the wood frame shutter idea and recycled glass. And I think there was some on additional material, just kind of some existing. And that really concludes my um, review. And the only thing I did add since sending it to you was the old garden um, plans because uh, Brooklyn Heights Association really asked for those to be included. And, uh, is there an image? Okay. You Should I leave it on this one? Uh, tell us as much as you want to. Go ahead. Actually, I would I would ask that you leave it on the image for a moment that is the most visible from the street. Oh, yes. OK, let me go back to that. Okay. This. Yes, exactly. Thank you. OK, um, I've walked by Kamaka for Collegiate for years, but I never know what grades. Uh, do you, does anybody here know what grades you guys cover? Yes, we um, we cover uh, from pre-K three, so that's three year olds all the way up through twelfth grade, um, okay. age eighteen. Uh, on this portion of the campus, we uh, serve first grade through twelfth grade, and currently our three year olds, uh, our three K through kindergartners, are served on our newer campus, which is um, on Clinton and Remsen. Oh, I didn't realize they can. They can start there and go right through. We call it little little, little packer and big packer. Yeah. Backpacker. <laughs> My heavens. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just state that Judy Stanton from uh, Brooklyn Heights Association states that Brooklyn Heights Association felt that they liked it, but they felt that it needed some more, more work. I'm just giving you her summary. This is not me. That's Judy, you know, what Brooklyn Heights Association had felt. Uh, all right, given that, uh, do we have any other comments from committee members and board members uh, on this application? Um, I have a question and or a comment and a clarification question, which is, um, I'm trying to be very clear about what aspect of this application that LPC wants us to comment on. Is it the entire application in terms of the size of the addition, the configuration of the windows, everything? Or is it one specific part of the application? Uh, my understanding, and maybe Maxine could help with this too, is that we're amending the application. So really any comments that this committee has, they'd like to convey to us. This is prior to going into the getting the detailed staff comments from LPC. So really any comments you have would be welcome. Well, Dortry, there were lots of changes made so we can comment on any aspect of it. Absolutely, absolutely, John. I just wanted to be clear if there was something specific. So please go ahead. Just, just a, uh, also a quick, Carlton, you said something about the, um, what is it, Brooklyn Heights Association? But I didn't quite understand what you said. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just going, yeah, I'm just trying to paraphrase what the, you only gave, she only gave a couple of sentences. That was just- But what know, was the you know, gist? Uh, they, were, they were not willing to give you a total yes. You know, she didn't feel that, she, you know, this is or. I would say Brooklyn Heights Association didn't want to give a total yes to your proposal, but they felt that it, the work was, as proposed, was good, but just not enough to get their uh, seal of approval, so to speak. Carlton, <laughs> if, Mr. Gordon, if they don't yes. have anything specific, that means they effectively approve the application. I move to approve the application. Okay, we have a move. All right, just want to show any, any other uh, people, any other committee members that want to make comments or questions about the uh, application? I'd like to second John's recommendation proposal. Okay, it's now second. So we have, we have a, mo a motion to approve. It's been duly seconded. 
Are there any other com comments or questions about the motion? I have a comment. Okay, go ahead. Um, whereas I see how much the application has changed since 2019, and I definitely think um, that the changes are um, more in keeping with the historic district. I will comment that you know, additions in historic districts are not supposed to try to fit in. Um, and I feel a little bit like this application is kind of somewhere in the middle, meaning mm -hmm. the 2019 application was radically modern um, and I don't think was appropriate. And this one is sort of a, almost a little bit too close to the existing historical buildings. And I know, and I practice, and I, I feel like it's the right um, approach to recognize that there needs to be a distinction. Now, I bring that up from the street view. When you look at the building from the garden, it's absolutely mm -hmm. a modern interpretation of historical building, which I think is fabulous. And I applaud you for CLT, the use of the of wood structure. I applaud you for all the passive house and sustainability stuff. All that is super great. But the view from the street appears to me to not quite be distinctive enough. And my comment would be that to please consider bringing some of those details, which set the garden view apart, um, to the street facade. Yeah. Um, really appreciate that because it was, you probably recognize this for the architects on the, it was a bit of a debate even within our committee and amongst the team. So we kind of, you know, but hearing that point of view, I think will be helpful as we work through with also staff comments. And I wouldn't be surprised if the staff comments were similar to yours. So much appreciated that for expressing that. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, any other thank you very comments? much. Yeah. So Daughtry's, do comments, with... Daughtry's comments are accepted as the slight amendment to the motion. Well, Thank you, John. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. We have any any other comments or questions? Daughtry, would you mind made? succinctly saying what you just said so I can make that into an amendment? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I <clears throat> excuse me. I drank water and went down the wrong way. <clears throat> I was <laughs> saying that I would recommend that the team consider bringing some of the architectural elements that are so distinct from the garden view to the view from the street. Great. All right, thank you, Daughtry. I think it's, uh, all right. Uh, do we have any other further comments or questions? Hearing none, okay, Karen, you wanna take the uh, roll? Sure. Um, I'll, yeah, okay. And I'll do a Lenny. I think we, you and I just were talking, discussing this. I'll go last. Okay, you got <laughs> Okay, uh, okay, but I will do all the others. Go ahead. Daltry? Yes. Ernest? Uh, yes. Carrie? It's Kari. Is that a yes? Oh, you, yes. Right. Cheryl? Yes. Esther? Yes. John? Yes. Myself? Yes. Judy is not here. Carlton? Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's eight yes. Zero. Eight, zero. Nothing. Oh, Karen? Yeah. Motion Karen. passes. Oh, not, we, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, Brian. Karen, you did not call me. It's true, Brian. Is Brian here? I, uh, yes. Oh, I, Brian's yes. here. I also vote yes. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. okay sorry about being late. That's nine zero zero. And thank you for coming, Brian. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. And the next one is nine. Willow Place, also on the Heights, uh, and they want to do some work uh, in, at the basement level, and yes, you know, and, yeah, basically around basement and so we have here, yes, and some of the openings around the building, you know, and 
front and back of the building as well. So yes. Okay, so nine Willow Place is the presenter available. Yes. Hi, how is everyone? I'm Michael Ingui from Baxter We Architects, and I'll share my screen right now. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes. Great. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, Michael Ingui from Baxter We Architects. Mr. Ingui, and... could you enter full screen, please? It's very small. Hmm. I can try. Uh, view. Yeah. There you go. I can. Oh. <laughs> there you go. If you can, you can. If you can, thanks very much. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it better now? I actually, I have never done that before. So thank you. Um, okay. Cool. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the house. It's Nine Willow Place. Um, here's Drollman Street. You can see my cursor as I move it around, right? Um, so here's Willow Place. Drollman the house is right here on the corner. Um, the rear yard openings that are in question cannot be seen from anywhere. Um, here is the rear yard uh, photograph existing. As you can see, there's a very tall wall on one side, tall wall and fence um, on the other side. This house has had a bit of work done to it over the years. You can see that there's a large opening, large opening with brick infill, large opening on the garden level. And what we are doing is we are modifying the doors in the large openings. Um, to look like this. I will actually zoom in if I can. Um, let me, sorry. Um, uh, so you can see that right now with the cursor on the left, these are the openings that are in place. These are the openings that are proposed. Uh, this is a slider that goes left and right. The openings that are in place, the opening that is proposed, it's one single slider that slides to the right. and these are the openings that are in the lower area, and these are the lower. These are the openings that are um, uh, proposed. One single slider that slides to the right. Um, the other thing that we're doing right now, you can kind of see the window on the garden level on the right, and the doors don't really follow the right load path. Um, so we're actually infilling brick and infilling brick so that all three openings align on the new facade, um, and uh, that's it. Here, here are some of the uh, plants, but here are the, some of the closer elevations of those windows. I'll leave it, I think, maybe on this one or, or this one, do you guess? That one's good. Thank Thanks. you. Oh, no, oh, they're, they're painted black as well. Sorry, in terms of color. Okay. Um, by the way, the reason this is here, because you may be wondering, uh, you just can't see it from anywhere. Um, there's a discrepancy in terms of what we're allowed, what they're allowed to approve at staff. I do not believe they can approve this at staff because we're not showing um, uh, millions division bars, and because the openings are large. I think I think that's why I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. Besides that, but you cannot see anything that you're looking here from uh, from a public way. Can I be, can I ask you, are you saying that this elevation cannot be seen from the street? No, this cannot be seen from the street. In fact, actually, the, the bottom two floors would be hard to see from anywhere. The, the walls on both sides are pretty tall. The so reason Mr. why Gordon, they're doing this, sorry, go ahead. Mr. Gordon, not for this uh, particular application, but at the end of the meeting, we need to discuss the value of having the community board entertain applications that cannot be seen by the public? Well, actually, on this one, there's some of it, I think, on this one, but it's. He just said there's nothing the... that could be seen. So here's, here's, the, here's the house. This is the rear yard. The LPC, yeah, but the LPC did ask. They said that they felt they could not uh, approve at, at, at staff level. And it, therefore, it was it sent on to us for our opinion. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. What... And Mr. Gordon, it cannot be yeah. seen from the public venue. Why people should have to spend time entertaining something that can be seen by the public? I think we need to talk about. 
Mr. Dew, are you making a motion? We have enough work to do. I'm making a motion, yes, absolutely. Put it on the floor, please, sir. Motion to approve this application as presented. Second. Okay, motion's approved and it's seconded. Do we have any other comments or questions on the uh, motion? Hearing none. Okay, Karen, you can go ahead and take the uh, roll. Sure. Daughtry? Yes. Ernest? Uh, yes. Carrie? Sorry, yes. Cheryl? Yes. Esther? Yes. Ryan? Ryan? Yes. Thank you, sorry. Uh, John? Yes. Myself, yes. And Carlton? Yes. That's another nine zero zero. Okay, thank you. The motion carries and you approve for a, a nine willow place. Now we're going to, like I said, we switched it around. So the next one's going to be at the two grace court. Um, or oh, I should mention just for the record, uh, there was um, on Nine Willow Place, I should mention Judy's uh, did a state that the Brooklyn Heights Association had no objection. I should just uh, get that in for the record. Okay, now we're gonna pop over to 205 Grace Court Alley. Uh, now we receive, okay, well, first of all, this is, what they're asking for is basically work to do additional roof work and, and work also going in to the basement, on the basement level as well. Now, we did receive a number of letters. We actually received three letters from neighbors on Grace Court Alley and over on Hick Street. Uh, they were very concerned about it. And I just want to get, just want to get those in a little bit of on record. Uh, we received letters from Ed Cerullo at Four Grace Court. Uh, we received a letter from Edith uh, Gilling of uh, 253 Hicks Street. And we received a letter also concerned from Donna and Bob Whitefake, 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 at 253 Hick Street. Uh, basically, they were they, their concerns was concerning the construction uh, of you know at work that would be that would affect their neighboring properties, which is uh, effect, and the work that would be done that which could affect the their own property from what the applicants doing. So what I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to just briefly state now the. There were a number of concerns, uh, and I just want to give the concerns out before, so that the applicant can maybe address them in their uh, in their presentation as well, uh, not just simply the uh, the presentation which we want to hear, but also just to be able to uh, see if we can address some of their concerns as well. Uh, I know there was some concern about a pizza oven uh, that's being built at the back. Uh, there was some concern about the work that's being done in the uh, basement level as well as how it will affect and, and, and work that's going to affect there's a wall that affects over, I think, for one for the on the uh, Hick Street side as well. Uh, what the two of the letter writers were concerned about was that if it's do does the app if the applicant has insurance, uh, which could cover any potential damage uh, as a result of the it's say something bad happens during the uh, work. So I think now all all three applicants said that they were not opposed. They were not opposed to the application. I should say all three letter writers were not opposed. In fact, their letters were welcoming to the uh, applicant. To coming into the community, but they were concerned about the work that's being done as a whole. And I think some of the committee members has seen the letters. I think we try to I try to summarize it. Uh, so let me. I'll now turn over to 
the applicant uh, make their presentation for Two Grace Court Alley. You can make a presentation and see if we can uh, also address some of those concerns as well. Thank you. Go ahead for Two Grace Court Alley. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, Michael Ingui from Baxter Ingui uh, again, uh, two in a row. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Grace Court Alley, Two Grace Court Alley is a really interesting and wonderful building. Um, it is, uh, it's uh, next to four Grace Court Alley, next to a project on uh, a house on, on Hicks Street uh, in Grace Court Alley, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, it's in relatively good shape. Uh, the doors and windows are being approved at staff level, including the garage door. But what we are uh, showing you today, um, I think I'm going to go here because I think it describes it the most. Um, and, 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 I'll, and I'll kind of jump around a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but I, I like showing it in diagram form first. It's a two story um, brick building. We're adding an addition that's minimally visible at the top, and which you can see here. Um, and we are excavating below the main portion of the house here. So um, uh, we've done this a few times on this block already. And we'll talk about both in more, more detail. We're also renovating, renovating and restoring the whole house. So um, <clears throat> just to talk about the addition and the visibility. Um, um, I don't think I can. There you go, perfect, because you're not going to see it otherwise. Um, the visibility is minimally visible. If you stand in one spot on the sidewalk, you can see just the top edge of the addition over here. Um, there's a lot covering it over here. The neighbor has a fence, which we'll look at in a second. Um, but if it didn't have a fence, you'd see a little bit of it all the way down Grace Court Alley there, um, a Grace Court there. There's a chimney extension that you'll also see. Um, nothing from this side. Um, this is just a, a blown up view of, of, of what you could see from that one vantage point. I'm gonna zoom back out now, hopefully successfully. Um, so what you're able to see is just that piece of the addition. Um, the way we've designed this addition is the roof line currently is pitched. Um, and instead of putting the addition on top, we're restructuring that to sink the addition in to make it as uh, minimally visible as possible. Um, just to jump around a little bit more, if you don't mind, because it'll, it'll give you a good sense of things. Um, and I'll annotate as I do it. We made sure it wasn't visible at all from behind um, and uh, by, by moving it to this side. Um, now, I, this is a great, um, place to talk about the neighbors a bit, and then we'll look at some photos. By the way, we've, we've met with each neighbor individually um, already and uh, understand and agree with their concerns. Uh, we let them know that we agree with their concerns, and um, we've uh, already uh, let them know that once we get our structural drawings back, that it will show the waterproofing, um, that we'll meet with them again and ensure that they approve that prior to us doing any construction. The contractor for this is to pay our construction, who's also done work for some of them. And the engineer we're using is also the engineer for at least one of them. So it's, um, uh, I think the, the, the neighbor conversations will hopefully continue to go well. Starting with for Grace Court Alley, there's a few things to talk about. We're underpinning the property line, um, but, but the, the, the rear, which I'll show you again in a section, uh, but the real concern is the waterproofing of this parapet because he's had issues on the other side of that. And we described a detail, we actually met him on site yesterday and have just described a detail that fully encapsulates that parapet even after we do a liquid applied flashing, which I'll show you in a second. The next thing to talk about is the house at Hicks Street, the Whiteford residence, which we, we, we actually have worked for Donna ourselves um, and, um, and it's a really nice house. Right now, the additions that are here that we're removing, there's an addition here and there's a glass addition here. You'll see these in a photo in a second. They currently pitch to her building and cause a lot of water damage that they've had to fix. We're removing both of these 
and then we'll wind up fixing that wall, which in my opinion makes that house uh, much more watertight than it is now. Why they would ever design something that pitches towards a neighbor's house without being able to really deal with that is uh, is a little crazy. And um, and we are, we'll, we'll talk about the house that's over here in section. It's a little bit easier. Um, and it take off. So as I continue to go through, this will start to show you the, the parapet detail next uh, door, where not only are we, are we gonna put liquid applied waterproofing along the whole parapet, the project we did next door, they really wanted exposed brick and it was the brick was left exposed and I believe moisture was leaching through. This one, we're not leaving the brick exposed. We're gonna leave, uh, we're gonna do liquid applied um, flashing the whole way and up the parapet, even though you'll see bluestone. Not only that, but we're gonna do standing seam to cover even that. So there'll be two kind of belt and suspenders for that. Um, just a little bit more detail. I'm gonna to go to the model because I think it describes it the best. These are some elevations of that. Some uh, This is the rear elevation of the house where uh, we're, in, we're installing a new window. There were already some big openings on the back. This is the white outline of where the additions are that we're removing. And here are some large openings that we're putting in their place, um, patching the brick, um, that, that addition on this side. Some elevations, it'll be uh, gray standing seam uh, roofing. Um, this is a passive house, so it doesn't really need a lot of mechanical. This is the mock-up that we've installed, and you can start to see what that looks like uh, on the neighbor's houses. You can start to see that parapet detail that the neighbor was concerned about. So if we had on this side of it, have it exposed the brick, uh, he was concerned that we were going to get water into that. So fully encapsulating this helps to helps to deal with that. Um, and I think the, these images show it the best. Um, here's the rooftop addition. This little edge right here, from here to here, is what's visible from that one spot in the sidewalk. Um, not visible from this, wide, this side. Um, I just want to, here you can start to see the additions that we're taking down. Here's that brick addition that is, um, and here's the glass addition, both pitched directly into Donna Whiteford's house, um, which is you know, not the best thing in the world. Um, I think the rest are window drawings. I would like to just continue to get to the section. Hang on one second. I zoomed past the sections and shouldn't have. Um, so <clears throat> current details, this is the street. A car would come in here. This is a carriage house. Um, there is no cellar right now. This is that rear yard. And um, uh, this is the addition that's pitching into the house next door. This comes down. There are lot line windows in uh, Edith's house. She's one of the people who wrote a letter. She also has a kitchen exhaust vent coming um, onto the property um, and a bathroom exhaust vent. Um, we have we've we've not decided to close these. In fact, the proposed is to leave those both open. We're going to help her uh, relocate the kitchen exhaust so it exhausts further up and not into the yard. But we have not asked for any of this to be removed. Um, and you can see the final detail. We're leaving a piece of the wall up here. We're going to waterproof all around that so Donna won't be getting that that waterproofing issue. We're going to put two yard drains in this location. <clears throat> and this shows the excavation. We have to underpin our front and rear walls. If I look at the other section, the house that's on Hicks Street on the corner already has a cellar that comes down this far. We do not have to underpin that wall. We only have to underpin the wall at four uh, Grace Court, which is shown right here. Um, as I mentioned, the way we'll do this, which is required in the landmark district, um, where we'll put both uh, vibration monitoring on all the houses and optical monitoring as required. So if anything were to happen, um, people would know as work was happening. But uh, for those of you who don't know, I mean, the way work is almost done all the time in a house this narrow is is by five gallon bucket and and, uh, and shovel. It's um, it's too difficult to get large machinery in these homes. So um, it's, it's all done by hand and all done very slowly. Um, 
I think that describes the project. I can, I can go on and on, but I could also answer questions if you have them. I'll, I'll leave it maybe on the rendering. There you go. Mr. Gordon, you're muted. Okay, th thank you for reminding me. Okay, uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, just to let you uh, let you know, Judy Stanton from the Brooklyn Heights Association uh, has announced that they are supporting your application. Uh, and I'm personally happy that you are working with the for, you know, with the people who wrote the letters to us, and they will be addressing their concerns and you'll be working with them. Uh, I know a little bit about these. I've walked through Grace Court Alley on, on several occasions. Everything is close to everything else right. right there. You know, one house is right on top of the other. So uh, I'll be glad to, to see that you are working with the neighbors to make sure that their concerns are addressed, that we're not going to have any collapses, and that the uh, mm -hmm. will be, especially the information on the underpinning, that's very important, and make sure that we don't have any uh, problems with that. All right, uh, with that, uh, do we have any uh, comments or questions from uh, committee members and board members? Yes, Mr. Gordon, this is John Dew. Uh, I have one question before I make a motion to approve because Brooklyn mm -hmm. Heights has no issues. Uh, uh, the vibration monitors that you mentioned going to main the work is done, or is that just during the course of the work? Um, yeah, so, so the way New York City Building Department and Landmarks works, it, it's um, it's while you do excavation, so right up until you're done and you're, and you're at grade, you're supposed to leave the vibration monitors in place. Um, uh, sometimes we leave them a little bit further until we're done with the structure. Um, everything sets them off. So um, trucks dropping um, um, containers, um, everything. So um, it's, it's helpful for us to, um, to leave them on sometimes for a little longer because it ensures that um, if something were to happen, uh, like a truck dropping a container, the guys can go outside and take a picture and say, what wasn't, wasn't the structural work? So very often we'll leave it until the structural work is completed, but the building department of landmarks requires you to keep it until you're at grade. Thank you I for think that. that's a good idea. Yes. Uh, I see Esther Blount has her hand raised. Esther? Hi. I just want to say, I don't know if any of the neighbors are here that wrote the letters. But if their gut is telling them they should be concerned, they should be concerned. The, the developer or the contractor having insurance is not enough. They need a license agreement. We have had so many buildings on this side that's been destroyed by very nice people like this man speaking, but their insurance does not cover your property. So I know we're not voting on this. I mean, on that, that, but this is very important. You know, Miss Sinisi um, brought a presentation to us some time ago talking about this, and it is so serious. These people need a, a, con a construction lawyer, and they need to get a license agreement. That's it. That'll be their choice, uh, Esther. Um, so far, they seem to be working well with the um, with the applicant, and they are. Everybody seems to know everybody else on this one, uh, but I think it's a good. It is a good suggestion. I don't know. Uh, we too bad that we don't have Judy Stanton uh, present. Uh, she might be able to process it on. You know, pass on that suggestion. It is a good suggestion. You know, just to protect themselves. But they uh, they have expressed their concerns, but at the same time, uh, and you, I'm sure you've seen the letters that they feel that they can work, and they want to welcome the uh, new, the new person, and just let's hope that this uh, one works out. It is a little, con you know, I am a little concerned uh, because it's, again, these are small buildings right next to each other, historic, old, been around for more than a century. I've walked down Grace Court Alley 
beautiful, uh, one of the most beautiful spots. When I take people in the Brooklyn Heights, I take them over to Grace Court Alley. So, but hopefully this will work out. Um, just, just a note on that, by the way. Um, yes, go ahead. Only because I agree with everything you guys are saying. Uh, uh, so the neighbors yeah. um, very often, and in this case will be the case as well, uh, we'll have structural engineers that will meet with our structural engineers prior to uh, work um, occurring as well, which I, I always recommend. Uh, everyone has to know what's happening. These are shared walls. Um, so uh, everyone should be comfortable with hap what's happening on their wall. We're also doing pre-construction surveys, which I also recommend to everyone. So taking photos prior to the work happening, having uh, structural engineers meet with structural engineers and having everyone be 100% comfortable with what's happening before work begins. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Is, none, uh, uh, I'm yeah. one of the neighbors. May I make a comment? Oh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Hi, go ahead. Um, one thing that you know, we did. Ed Cerullo. Okay, no, I, I meant Ed I'm Cerullo Julie Cerullo. Cerullo with it, the uh, for Grace Court Alley, yeah. Um, one thing yeah. that we addressed just now, and I do want to say thank you to our. Uh, soon to be new neighbors and um, their architects for being very solicitous of our concerns. Um, one thing that didn't come up just now um, was the pizza oven, which I do have a concern oh, about. It, it's gone. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Out. <laughs> no pizza for us? I should have mentioned it during the presentation. I forgot about the pizza <laughs> oven. <laughs> All right. No pizza for us, folks. Sorry. <laughs> What's funny is it was it was out a little while ago and it says somehow survived the drawings. Okay. <laughs> the pizza oven likes to be in the project. All right. Has the big the grill has the big grill gone? I'm sorry. Has the big grill gone? Yeah, yeah the, 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 uh, the item that we that we're showing with the pizza oven is, is no longer there. Oh, I'm so not saying, I'm not I'm not saying they want to have a barbecue in the back if they want a barbecue, but but that but that that whole Piece is gone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm not saying they won't have a barbecue if they want to have a barbecue. I, I can't. I, I could never say that. Carlton, the motion to approve is already made. Uh, yes. Second. 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 Do we have a second? Second. second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Are there any comments or questions? Hearing none. Okay, Karen. All right, Daltrey. Yes. Ernest? Uh, yes. Carrie? Uh, yes. Cheryl? Yes. Esther? Can you come back to me? I'm reading something. Can you? Yeah, I just, it's something bothering me. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Uh, John Duke? Yes. Myself? Yes. Uh, Calton? I'll okay. give it a yes. Yes for Calton Bryan? Yes. All right. And Esther. One second. No worries. Okay. Yes. All right. We're in right. zero, zero. Karen, if you get, if you call Kari's name, if you say it incorrectly one more time, I think you get the automatic boot. You've had your three strikes. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's Kari, right, Kari? Yes. Okay. I have a weird name, so I I pay attention to these things. <laughs> Just think of a car. Keep telling me, please. Thank you. Okay, car. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay, we'll get we'll we'll get it we'll get it right by December. <laughs> okay. And the last one is two hundred five Hicks Street, also in in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, this is, we want to do some work. Uh, for it's at a nail salon at the corner of a you know at the corner of the corner building, uh, and they want to do some work on the uh, it's an aluminum siding, I guess aluminum fixture at the front as well. Uh, so the applicant, we proceed on that one. Two hundred five Hicks Street. Anybody? How you doing? Can you hear me? Good. Yes. Go ahead. All right. Very good. Hi. My name is Peter Rugavero. I'm a principal architect for 
PGM Architect, um, representing Andrea Balsamo. She's the owner of 205 Hicks Street. Uh, it's also known as 89, 91, and 93 Montague Street. Um, so an application was filed with the Department of Buildings as well as with landmarks. Uh, we're basically what we're doing is we're legalizing uh, an existing uh, storefront. Uh, it's a storefront uh, that was issued, it was a violation that was actually issued back in 2006. Uh, it's the easternmost uh, storefront of the three. There's three existing storefronts. Uh, we're legalizing the one that was installed back in 2006. Uh, <clears throat> that's the one all the way to the right. It's currently, like you said, it's currently um, occupied by a nail salon. Uh, all three storefronts are all um, uh, anodized aluminum and glass. Um, that's that's the style of, of the uh, storefront. Um, now, the storefront to the left, which is currently a deli. Uh, Mr. McAvoy? Yes. Do you have a visual presentation to share this evening? Oh, I, I had submitted that um, during my um, request for tonight's meeting. I thought I thought that was going to be something that you would um, have available. Okay. I, I don't I don't have it to present right now. I, I thought that was something. If you have it available, that'd be great. If you have I want think so they could see it. Um, is that possible? By the Can way, we Google the storefront and get a picture of it, Mr. Um, Gordon? I, I, I had submitted uh, photographs of, there you go, perfect. If you go to page okay. two on that. There we go. Yep, there you go. So that's that's the current, uh, that's the existing storefront that's there now that we're looking to legalize. Um, that's the photo right there. And, and I basically drew up the uh, what's currently there as well. And if you, also, I submitted photographs of all three storefronts. So you could get a, a visual of what's going on there. There you go. So those are the three storefronts. So the deli's to the left. The store in the middle right now is vacant. And we're, we're legalizing the storefront to the right. And I believe I have three individual shots of all three storefronts as well. There you go. So that's, that's the existing deli. That was actually already approved by Landmarks way back. Uh, that one's vacant. That's existing. That, that's exist and this is the one we're legalizing. Now, the only difference between our storefront and the storefront that was that Landmarks had approved, that one right there, the one to the left, you'll see the deli. Um, the, the entrance door is actually to the left, uh, whereas in our storefront, uh, the entrance door is in the center of the, um, of the storefront. Uh, it's the same material, all three, uh, same material, same style, um, really the only difference Dating back to 2006 is really the location of the um, of the entrance doors. Uh, so what we'll try and do here is just legalize it, take care of the violation. Um, that way we get that dismissed. Um, Landmarks feels that had we had had the, had the storefront had a door similar to the deli on the left side, it it would, it would be approved by staff. Uh, but because the door is centrally located. Um, it, it, it's probably not a staff level approval at this point, uh, only because of the entrance door location. And that, that's pretty much, that's the application. Uh, we're not looking to do work, we're looking to, to legalize the work. And this is on the Montague Street side of the, of the building. That's correct. At, at the, the store to the left is 89 Montague. The one in the middle that's vacant is 91. Um, so the nail salon, the one to the right that we're looking to legalize, that's 93 Montague. And that's, that's pretty much it. Okay, I think you had any questions or comments on the uh, presentation? I just have a quick question. This is a little bit annoying, but I'm not sure what we're supposed to do here. I mean, you're trying to do the right thing by legalizing something that's existing. If we were designing this, I'm not sure that I would put the door in the middle, but I'm not sure that I have the right to say anything about it at this point. <laughs> Do they do good nails? It's the question. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> so I move to approve. I second. I'll, I'll second that. Okay, motion to approve and new seconded. 
Are there any comments or questions on the motion? I have a question for the applicant. Sure. Go ahead. I'm just curious. Um, uh, we're legalizing the storefront. I'm just curious how it does not currently conform. The, the main difference is the location. Well, just comparing it to a previous approval, which was the Delhi, which is the one to the left, uh, 89 Montague. Uh, the only difference is the location of the mm -hmm. entrance door. Um, that was approved entrance door to the left. This one was uh, had the, uh, the entrance door in the middle. OK, thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize that was the only way. Really. OK, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Are there any other further comments or questions? Hearing none, uh, Karen, okay, you can take the roll. All right, Daughtry? Yes. Ernest? Uh, yes. Kari? Did I say it right? Sorry. Yeah, you did, you did, yep. Okay, yes, uh, Cheryl? Yes. yes. Esther? Yes. Brian? Yes. John? Yes. Myself? Yes. Carlton? Yes. This is a rare occasion where all our votes are. Yeah, nine, nine zero, zero, zero. Okay. I was just curious, I have to ask the presenter, are you related to the old bishop? Oh, uh, great question. Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, same name, though. No, I mean, there's not that many McGovern's. <laughs> It's funny because every once in a while I would get a phone call, you know, uh, <laughs> for the uh, uh, requesting, you know, um, questioning the name. As <laughs> they well. want you to so forgive their sins. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Father. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, next, I have a few things, you know, just a couple of quick items uh, in the uh, chair's report. Uh, let's see, what did I have here? Yes. A uh, couple of things of interest that I've, I've come across. Uh, at eight, over at, on Fulton Street, over, you know, near, uh, just, just uh, by, uh, I was trying to just record, not to, uh, let's see, over oh, by, uh, by J Street. Uh, there's a $25 million, uh, at eight, was it eight, eight, 835? Yeah, 830, uh, J Street. Uh, there was a $25 million purchase of the property over there. Uh, another purchase is NYU has purchased a property uh, in Metrotech, one of the Metrotech buildings. Now, I wasn't able to get the exact, which one of the exact buildings, but NYU now has a, a deed ownership of one of the properties that's over there. Uh, Karen has informed me that the uh, there's a foreclosure going on at the Bossert Hotel which is a bit sad because we did do some approval and we were hoping to see the Boston Hotel over on Montague Street opening soon. Uh, one of the things that interested me personally at the Boston Hotel was that this was the site where after the Brooklyn Dodgers won the 1955 World Series, the Dodger, you know, Dodger players and wives and staff went and celebrated. So I, I was considered at a site of historic importance. And speaking of the Dodgers, I had a chance to go to the Jackie Robinson Museum in Manhattan. Uh, it's not just a sports place. They have some references to sports. It's mostly actually a civil rights museum. Uh, and I do recommend people to take a look at it. All right. Okay, and uh, yes. Oh, yes. And I have one other little thing here. Dumbo is on the cover. I don't know if I can, if you can see it or probably not. Uh, Dumbo is on the cover of the New Yorker magazine, The New Yorker, for September 26th. 
So Dumbo is is really gotten up there right now, Karen. <laughs> That's going to get the people to uh, want to buy property and move over right. there. I don't see them out drinking wine right now, but I'll yeah. wait. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It'll come back down with the reconstruction of the cantilever. Huh. That's the, the say the least. <laughs> Carlton, may I add something to the report? Yes, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Um, I just have a quick note. Um, many of you are familiar with ANHD, the um, Association of Neighborhood. Uh, I can't remember the name right now. Oh. ANHD. I'll well, put it in the Association race. of Neighborhood Housing, Housing Development. Yeah. Thank you. They yeah. just recently put a, an, an article out, which I'll put in the chat, regarding how AMIs should actually be calculated in New York City. I see John Dude nodding his head. This supports a lot of the work that the community board as a whole has been looking at over the last few years regarding actual AMI. Um, and I I would encourage all of us to read it. Again, I'll put the link in the chat in a second, but just the quick summary is that, and I'm gonna quote, um, what does this AMI analysis tell us? This year's AMI cheat sheet, which is one of the things they produce every year, reveals dramatic disparities. About half, 49.3% of New York City renter households fall into what we call the extremely low income or very low income AMI categories. So remember, that's less than 60% AMI. However, these the number of these households makes all, up almost 80% of all the households in New York City. So in other words, like eight in 10, um, you know, rent burden households make up less make less than 50% AMI. And just all that to say that I think that we're on the right track with our analysis and that we should keep it up, uh, putting pressure on, on our housing funders to actually to support the development of actually affordable units instead of these ridiculously overinflated New Jersey and Rockland and Westchester County AMI um, thresholds that are set by the feds. So thank you. So Daughtry, I, 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 I sent out Go some ahead. comments earlier today, Mr. Gordon, that actually yes. line up with what Daughtry just presented to the committee. When we did our rezoning in 2004, and we were given all these promises by the city, what happened as a result of that upzoning is that the community of low income color, downtown Brooklyn, was totally displaced. None of the affordable housing that has been built and affordable is in quotations, uh, has been accessible to the folks that were displaced. So we as a community board were in the forefront almost two decades ago in the upzoning and the creation of the high homeless problem that the city has today. But we approved so, commercial. We didn't approve residential at the time, as I recall. We approved upzoning of all of downtown Brooklyn. So you had a lot of building condemnations. It was a very low income community of color. And, and, and Karen, I had been visiting downtown Brooklyn for my entire life. No, I it's a totally I different we animal. Also, today. We were sold a bill of goods that didn't pan out, but I understand that even with that, we displaced people. I understand. That's Say it actually, again. You understand what? That even though I think that we were deceived a little bit in how the zoning would pan out, that we also did displace people even with commercial. So I understand what you're saying in that regard. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I just, and, sorry. and so I, I still have to, I have to take some responsibility for the state of things today because the community board has never formally reacted to the results of the upzoning that occurred first in this new cycle of the last two decades in community district two but we are still suffering from it and it has yet to be corrected. No one is talking about correction. Every application we get has as affordable housing 
80% of AMI. That's not affordable as Daughtry just indicated to most of the people in New York. And the folk downtown Brooklyn were probably closer to the 40 or 50% AMI uh, uh, of, of affordability. What as a community board can we do to put the city, the folks that are responsible for approving these applications, our elected officials, we have to go on record as identifying the problem and asking that everyone take steps to correct it. It's a great segue into the district needs statement. Can I just add something? You know, uh, you keep talking about the 80% uh, AMI. You can look at that, but you also have to look at the price of land downtown Brooklyn. I mean, uh, when we did the up zoning, uh, it really uh, stimulated. The price of land became so exorbitant that the only thing that can support it would be luxury housing. It had not, I mean, you know, that's the other thing that we don't really have a grab soaring and talk about is the square footage of land downtown Brooklyn. It is exorbitant and it's not going to really uh, benefit um, low income housing or moderate income housing. It's just, this is not a suburb. It's not some farmland. And we have to be able to put that in context. But Ernie, they're putting homeless hotels downtown. No, I, under I understand that, John. But I'm saying is that we can't solve all the machinations. I, I, we I'm have not to point out that the problem have, and come together I, to figure out a solution. No, if you're going to talk about town, downtown Brooklyn, yeah, you have to put it in this proper context. I mean, a price of land in Manhattan. I mean, it's just amazing. The course of land per square foot, that's all. I think everybody, I think is correct. I think also bear in mind when the uh, upzoning was done, it was done around the time of the attacks at the World Trade Center. And one of the things that uh, was pushed was that, well, we can start doing, we can start to build these, rebuild, commercial office space in downtown Brooklyn. And that was one of the selling points at that time was that they would do it. And we hardly have any commercial, new commercial space that's been built in the, you know, in our area. But we have loads and loads and loads of high rent affordable housing in this area. I think everybody, I think everybody has it correct. Um, I don't know if, how we can make it into the district needs, but it's something to think think about. How do we get the city to do it? Because if this is a, when we ask for district needs, yes, people do need housing. People, regular people, people with moderate to low income do need housing. How do we get the city to do that? So far, the only thing they came up with is this affordable housing uh, thing. Say, well, okay. no, that, 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 I, I would take issue with that, Mr. Gordon. Yeah. We have to set a standard for affordable housing in community, district two, and then let the city and the developers figure out how to get us there. The fact is, we at this committee had discussed having the developers either, and I'm going to take this to another issue, the ADA compliance. We were supposed to have, in addition to this upgrading, the community benefits. None of the community benefits that we asked for with approval of the upzoning have happened. We don't have any of the subway entrance made ADA compliant, none. We have some half buildings where the developer put the elevator down to the mezzanine but has no provision to go down to the platform. We have not been addressing that. We asked in this committee, along with transportation, for a 400 car parking garage under the Duffield Street Park. That somehow got eliminated. So we now don't have a plan to get rid of all of the agency government permit parking that is on the sidewalks of downtown Brooklyn. We actually came up with concepts 
that would have solved some of these problems if we had gotten the right folk to grab a hold of it and incorporate it. That's been a success downtown. The thing that hasn't been a success is what the community needs in, in exchange for everything that happened downtown. We have to approach this and let's not try to solve the problem. This is a community benefit. We have to identify the benefit, not the solution. Well, I'll ask what I think I can ask for you to do, ask any of the committee members, let's come up with a, uh, a proposal that would address that issue. What benefits do we rece are receiving? And let's focus on what we were supposed to receive and did not receive as a result. I don't know which programs were there where we were supposed to receive specific benefits. But if you can find that out, bring it up to the committee and let's see if we can push it along. Well, up I'm bringing it up now. I'm bringing yeah. it up. Well, I need, well we need some old. specifics. Yeah, we need some specifics. And if we can get the specifics, we can try to push that up. It's a little, you know, some of it is a little tricky, but we can maybe do it. I'd like to just give a chance now for the on uh, the community forum. We've heard, we discussed, I think, our business, old and new business. I'd like to move on to non-committee members, non-board members, if there are any still on, uh, to speak about any issue that they would like to bring up at this time. Mr. Gordon, you said, are you saying we're finished with the community uh, 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 benefits portion of the discussion? That we, uh, uh, I would say what we should do is on uh, this point, I'd like to get some more on community benefits. I'd like to get more detail as to if we have, because uh, I know I am, the much I am aware of, but a community benefit comes from a development of a specific program or something that was the uh, promise. Let's say you will put up this building and in return, you will get this uh, particular development. I like to get, if you if people can do the research, find a specific community uh, benefit that was not granted and as a result of a specific thing that was a program or something that was done. So I'd like to get, let's get more detail on that. If you can, people can do their research on it. I don't know where we can begin, but if that's something that any of you can dig up, find out, and we can maybe let's put, you know, we'll put it on the table. I just want to give a chance now to the people who are not community members or community board members, or members of the committee, I want to give them a chance once again. Now I want to give them a chance to speak. I don't think nobody's here. This is Esther. Can we do the all yeah, yes, the um, district needs or all of district the district needs? Yeah. Participated. What are we supposed to be working on, poetry? Um, something. Well, so Taya can. Taya is our fearless leader in this, and I don't know how many of you were at the general meeting. I think most of us were where the um, city planning gave a presentation that absolutely made my mind spin. I think that what they're asking us to do is really, really challenging, and I get really frustrated with it. They're asking us to basically say, well, what does your district need? And which agency do you need it from? And how much will it cost? And um, that's really hard to do, even for people who are smart yes. like us, right? But if we don't do it, we lose our opportunity to put ourselves or put our community's requests out to the agencies. So we're in this pickle now because here we are, we're in the middle of September. This crap, I was gonna use a different word, is due in <laughs> October. And it's really, it's really terrible the way that the whole thing is terrible. But that said, we have to do it. So if you remember Taya's great presentation um, where she said, you know, there are two different kinds of requests. One is a capital request, which is like hard cost expenditure. For example, please build we need a, a truly affordable housing. All the AMIs need to be 40% AMI or lower. Build a building on this lot. It's going to cost you $75 million. We can say that 
you know, something very concrete. And then we can also, there's a request for um, uh, a budgetary, right, Taya? A budgetary request where you ask an agency to explore an idea or to get more information on a concept. And those are kind of the two buckets of requests. <laughs> and we're supposed to come up with our top three and there's just so many things to talk about, but I don't know, Taya, can you help us? That was pretty good, Dudry. Um, let me adjust myself. Hi. Um, so DCP has adjusted our process a bit. They're also working a little more closely with us because they're interested in some experiments in community outreach. So the survey that has gone out has only been live for since Friday. It is already the most wildly popular survey that the board has ever done in my tenure here. So as I just outlined in the chat, the first step is collecting community input for one month. And yes, we should have had more time. The number one point of feedback that I give to DCP every single year for three years now is that the process needs to start in May or June before you go on summer recess so that you and the board office have time during summer recess to do some of the research, to look up some uh, historic budget numbers, to uh, form coalitions with partner organizations that are willing to support our budget requests, right? They seem to have heard that this year, but it is too late to put that in motion. The number one thing I would emphasize is that the community board input is the first step in the citywide budget process every year. So it is an incredibly powerful opportunity for input, right? So the first step this year, the public district survey is live. I've put the link in the chat. I've been emailing it to everyone. Please take the survey yourself. Please circulate it to everyone in your building, at your office. It is for anyone who lives or works in the district. And what I'm already seeing in the numbers from the responses we've gotten back, about 50% of the residents of the district do not work in the district during daytime hours. So it's important to circulate this at your work groups as well, right? The, that district-wide public survey, step one, that's gonna close on October 11th. And then for 48 hours, I'm gonna do a bunch of data crunching. We're gonna come up with a prioritized list from that survey. That is gonna go back to the board and you're gonna repeat the process that we did the last two years, which is you're gonna get a survey where just for the board, this is not a public, Poll. The board gets their own survey after the public survey, where you get to give each idea a number from one to five. Do you remember this? Like whether it was, Esther remembers good. <laughs> then the that's open for 10 days. The office will do a whole mm -hmm. bunch of number crunching again. And then a few days before your general meeting in October, we wish there was more time, but this is the schedule we were given. Um, October 19th, you will get the final list of priorities and you will ratify that at the October meeting. And then we have 10 days normally to produce a 50 page document, John Dew <laughs> remembers this process well. Yes. Um, except in this case, we have even less time because DCP is has asked for some additional processes for our district because we are their guinea pig this year hopefully to make the process better next year. So the process is different. It is wider in that we're doing a lot more public outreach. Um, but I, I, if you found the process manageable the last two years, hopefully this year it will seem very familiar. Tell you, at the same time, can you get a list from Department of City Planning of how much of what we have asked for in the past has actually been funded? Yes. Can we know that? Yes. So that would be very helpful for us in terms of going forward, how we should focus. So actually, um, Mr. Gordon, if I could mm -hmm. uh, yeah. if I can engage in a very brief show and tell, you actually already have access to that. So let me just show you one thing, which it's going to take me a second to pop up because I don't have book yeah. on this particular laptop. One second. Uh, okay. 
So I know you've seen this before and I know it looks like a bunch of garbage, but I'm just gonna show you one more time. <laughs> so this is your one-stop shop for all things district beans, right? And let me just review for you one more time what's in here. So this first tab is just a 101. This is where you can come if you need a refresher on how the heck does this process work. You might remember that visual was the, the presentation that I gave last spring. In here, you're going to find the timeline, where we are in the timeline, right? So right now, we're, we're in the, the, public, the, the public survey launch, right? And this is exactly what I just said. October 11th, the public survey closes for 10 days. You guys will get to do a prioritization survey. Link is coming, link TBD. And then the 19th, you'll ratify it. And then the office will be doing some processes with the CD, with the Department of City Planning, right? And then we submit it by Halloween. But these are really good resources for you also, actually, particularly for the brand new board members who maybe didn't see this presentation in the spring, right? If you need an overview of any of these processes, here are the five items that were created by the Department of City Planning to help board members. There's an overview, oops, an overview, a timeline, tips to strengthen submissions, a video that gives a process overview and submission tips, a video of the 2020 census data and online tools, which are also available to you in our district resources spreadsheet, right? And then there are a couple more resources that I've added because I end up using them a lot. One of them is this Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, the OMB publications page. OMB is the other city agency that works on this with us along with DCP, right? This is the budget request category guide. I had found this very helpful in the last two uh, seasons. However, I have found it less necessary to use because the public survey has done the work DCP has done the work of taking all of the city agencies and splitting up it, them up into seven policy areas. That is why the public survey is only eight questions. One question for each policy area and then one overall. Um, here is the official DCP profile of our district. If you've never seen this, definitely worth a visit. Um, I include a link to this in every single newsletter that goes out, every single email signature, this is the snapshot of our district and it's got lots of great data in there. DCP has not updated it yet with the 2020 census data, right? So some of the, this, like, I think our actual number this year is 130,000. Um, let me move this and go back. So there are only three tabs in this. And then the, you know, there's the, the explanations of each of the six working committees and their related agencies with links. The second tab are all of your brainstorming ideas, which we won't dwell on that one. So this third tab, so the fiscal year, sorry about the, the noise. Um, we are currently working on fiscal year 24. So when you see FY23, that means this was last year. So I'm going to do this. This is going to look horrible when I zoom out because it's just going to look like an indistinguishable bunch of colors, right? This is intentional. Every single block in here is one of your requests from last year. And I have sorted and color coded every single agency response in these two columns, right? Yellow means you got a yes. Blue means you got a bureaucratic maybe. Red means you got a no. This column indicates what if any actions were suggested, right? So you requested something, the city agencies responded, and sometimes if they were feeling, if they had their caffeine that day, they also suggested a follow-up. Some of the committees, and you guys are at a little bit of a disadvantage because most of your time is spent with certificate of, of, of uh, appropriateness applications, right? Some of the committees have already gone through this. As you can see, a lot of these are already grayed out. That means that the committees have already gone through last year's and pulled them, either pulled them forward to this year or decided to get rid of them. This committee is gonna to have to do that on its own. However, good news, bad news, is that you didn't have as many as some of the other committees did because yours tend to be different kind, bigger asks. So you had, you had fewer, but bigger asks. So all of that is here for you. 
if anybody ever needs to walk through this, you email me or call me. Thank you, Taya. I think it's, we do have a lot of difficulty. Our asks are probably bigger because the needs of people who do not have much money are bigger. Uh, and that's going to be one of the problems that we're facing is how do we meet one, those two things together to get them the, the oh, uh, residents that we need. If you, if you right. look at nothing else, I would definitely recommend this. I'm going to link it for you. It's the tips for strengthening submissions. And the number one thing takeaway from that is it's got to be specific. This board cannot ask for citywide budget requests. This board needs to ask for very specific things. Some of the things that are the fastest yeses are literally requests that have an intersection somewhere in the paragraph. That's how you know it's gonna, it, it's gonna move forward. It has so to be you, you said that we did not put anything about addressing the homeless population because it is a citywide issue, but we should not- no. We need them to our so, district. There, there, absolutely not, John. You should. So there are two parts, as Daughtry mentioned, right? So the full title of this exercise is statement of district needs. Clearly, clearly, additional resources for our houseless, our homeless residents is one of them, right? Statement of district needs and budget requests. So those are two different things. The budget requests have to be very specific. So, for example. Um, the, the okay. thing I keep saying to myself when I'm reviewing the incoming survey responses is, and yet, unfortunately you'll see some of those comments in the board dashboard as well. So many times we get something that is not a budget request. It is a complaint. It is an observation, but it is not a budget request. And that doesn't mean it's not a statement of need. It simply isn't a budget request. So have to, let's say, put a, I was gonna say, me, for example, the whole, Go ahead, I'll just quickly say homeless. Okay. Is there a need for home, you know, homes for the homeless? What budget requests do we make to get homes to the homeless in this district? Or maybe That's we can find an empty lot part. somewhere and ask them to develop the empty lot or, or repurpose a building that's not being used correctly or something. Carlton, I totally understand the spirit of your question, and that's a good example. So the statement of need would be. Our district needs more immediate housing solutions for our unhoused residents, right? The budget request part of that would be, we request more funding for X specific project located in Y specific neighborhood. That would be a budget request. Right, has to be something specific, not just a, a general, we just need more housing, period. That's right. It has to be a specific. The, the general statement, we need more housing, that goes in the statement of district needs. And that is coming through, actually that specific one is coming through very clearly in our survey for the third year in a row, right? But the budget request, we have to ask for something specific to go along with that statement of need. I'm, I'm not clear how we can go about identifying specifically, for example, with this, homeless request, it requires a building and everything else that goes along with it. How do we have the resources to get that deep into the well? Here's an example. Well, you know, I would encourage you to just be gentle to yourselves too. You don't have to be an expert in everything. John, to, to elevate an example that is very close to your heart over here on Myrtle. So another statement of need that's coming through very strongly is we need help for, we need more mental health services, right? That is a clear statement of need. To make that a more specific budget request, both are valid. We need the statement and we need the budget request. John, you, you're aware of the PSIT program at Fort Greene, right? Yes, vaguely. So, so maybe a good budget request, this is where you get to get creative. Maybe a good budget request to go with that statement of need is we request additional funding for the public private peace at program at Fort Greene to be expanded on to assist the merchants on Myrtle Avenue in addition to the park on Myrtle Avenue. That's one example. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I was trying to think of something that oh, would that's be a good, that's a good example. 
That is a good That's example. Good. You put it yeah. in. <laughs> so we also, as part of our uh, community benefits, ask for a public restroom in, in our John, uh, your uh, audio is a little bit glitchy. We had also asked for a public bathroom in downtown Brooklyn that was separate from people having to go to the basement of the mall to use the restroom. Well, that's it's, that one's done. You've already written that one. The need is we need more public restrooms in downtown Brooklyn. The budget okay. request is where do you want to put it? Pick a location. So, but my other question is, we made the request, how do, I how do we identify where that's at in this process so that we don't repeat it? Um, the office kind of does some of that filtering for you. Okay. So I, okay. don't, don't worry too much about, re about repeating yourself. It, it's normal for, uh, I don't know who says this all the time, but you know, the, the city of New York is not is not a racing boat. It is a it is a luxury yacht liner that takes many years to turn around, right? So it is totally normal to keep asking for the same thing for a few okay. years in a row, particularly during the last three years of COVID budget cuts, right? There have been many things that we have asked for that have not been able to move forward because um, the city agency budgets simply weren't available for them. And that's reflected in the city agency responses. Many times they have said, the agency supports this request. Please look at that dashboard. The city agency supports this request, but does not have the budget for it this year, which is a, a, a big clue to you. Ask again next year. Maybe circumstances will be different. I think one of the fun things about the public survey uh, is how many people have written into the office to say how, or just commented in the survey comments about how difficult it is. And that's kind of the point. I mean, we're not even asking for things for the whole city, but it is difficult to look at those lists of city agency priorities and pick which one's the most important because we don't have, the city doesn't have a limitless budget. It should be hard. Hey, yeah, I get tired just looking at you <laughs> and how you keep up with all of this. I know it's 745, I wrap it up. <laughs> All right, well, I think we've hit our, you know, we've hit our, you know, we've hit the wall on this point right now. I yeah. think that's, if people have, look for ideas as you go through the community, we find something specific, either a specific program or a specific location, as Karen said, I think Karen's point was very good. If there's some property just sitting there, in the you know in CB two, that's just sitting there, that could be of use. Let's see if we can put that to use or something like that. You know something on like that. We have no uh, other community input. I like to put our adjournment at this time. So moved. Okay. Yes, I second that. I'll second. I mean, thank you very much. I think we had a productive meeting, and. Uh, I think everybody, I guess for, uh, especially um, if the new com committee members, if you do not have my email, uh, I'll give it to you right now. Uh, you can use my, it's my, well, my best email is my full name, Carlton Gordon 77 at yahoo.com. Can you put it uh, in the chat, name? Carlton? Okay, thank you. So you can, uh, yes, if, or this if anybody has 77 to you. Yeah, well, 70 is, uh, my old, well, I'm so old, one of my favorite shows was 77 Sunset Strip. Uh, <laughs> how many people, how many people, how many remember that? I thought it how was you. Remember I thought that? it was Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., I thought it was Roger you. Smith, and Cookie. Cookie, Ed Let Cookie Burns. <laughs> Ed Cookie Burns. I thought that Burns. was the year you were, I thought that